Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Alex. Today, I want to talk to you guys about the new Netflix series, I Am Not Okay With This. I started watching this series the other day, and I finished it all in one day. Which is not that great of a feat, you guys. Hold the applause. It's only about seven episodes long. So... It's pretty dope. I like the general concept of it, and it is made by the same folks who did the end of the effing world. In this show, the main character, Sydney, has lost her father recently. He committed suicide in their family's basement, leaving her mother, who is a waitress, to be the sole provider for her and her little brother. So Sydney is a teenager, she's about 15 or 16, I guess, and her little brother Liam is about probably 11, 10 or 11, and they live in Brownsville, Pennsylvania, the pollution capital of their state. In this regard, Sydney is really not enjoying life right now. She is a teenager growing up in a super bummer of a time and a bummer of a town without her father, with whom she was the closest with. She had identified more with her dad than with her mom, and since her father died a year ago when the show starts, she and her mother haven't really had a conversation about it, and they mostly just bicker with each other, although both the mom and Sydney get along well with the little brother, Liam, who seems to have far more emotional intelligence than either of them. So, throughout this story, Sydney starts to get superpowers that tend to be tied to her emotions. So, when she's getting really upset or angry, then small things start happening initially, like she makes a crack in her wall or she throws a rock at a sign, and that sign gets pulled up out of the ground and goes like another 20 feet when it really should not have done that at all. Sydney's magical powers, or her superpowers in this case, seem to come from pain, which I think is very interesting when compared with the TV show The Magicians. We talk about that at the end of season four in The Magicians when Julia has been stripped of her powers in order to save her life, really, and she's no longer able to use magic, which is very distressing for Julia because she has a very complex relationship with magic, and she's kind of almost an addict for it in a way. So she isn't able to use it, and then we see her able to kind of manipulate Q's cards that she was about to throw into the fire, and Q and Penny, who are about to go back down to the underworld, the rest of the characters can't see them, Q smiles through his tears, and he says that magic comes from pain, and I thought that that was very beautiful, And in that way, it reminds me a little bit of Harry Potter, although it's not true in canon in the Harry Potter universe, but we see that Harry does experience a lot of emotional pain, and he is a pretty great wizard. 
So I like to juxtapose those and to make those considerations. And in this case, with I am not okay with this, Sid's powers do seem to really come from pain, like Julia's do. Although in The Magicians, it is considered to be magic. And the direction that I am not okay with this seems to be going in seems to be more associated with the supernatural and like superpowers. We have a heavy load of comic books in this. We see one that is called Spider Tales at one point that very much looks like a Miles Morales type of Spider-Man. And I really enjoyed the fact that they chose Miles Morales for the cover of that particular book. It's not said to be Spider-Man. It is called Spider Tales, but I think we all know from looking at the cover where it's going with that. There's also one called Not Men, which I believe is supposed to just be a play on X-Men, and it's interesting that they took that approach. I'm not sure why they took that approach. I don't know if they just couldn't get the rights to do that or if that was just a component of the comic book that this TV series has been based on. However, it's also from the same producer who did Stranger Things and the same director of The End of the Effing World. So you can see a lot of similarities between the different shows in their artistic styles and their approaches. The narrative component is not as well developed, I think, as Stranger Things, but I still very much enjoyed it, and the actors in this show really bring it across. I was very excited to see two of the kids from It in this show, and it's fun that they are going through and doing more supernatural work following their Stephen King movie debut. I really also enjoyed that there are little throwbacks and references to Stephen King within the story. You see the main character, Sid, covered in blood at several points throughout the series. That is part of a flash forward to the season finale. And she looks very reminiscent of Carrie from the uh, school dance scene in that manner. Also, if you pay attention to the background of the scenes, Sid is clearly a big fan of Stephen King, and we see a lot of Stephen King books on her bookshelf. The show is overall pretty cool. I liked it a lot. I like the interactions between the characters. There is also some 80s references in there too, so it's very clear that uh, there's a lot of idolization of the 80s in the show. There's a scene reminiscent of The Breakfast Club. There is also a lot of the characters' hairstyles that are very reminiscent of John Hughes movies in particular. I like that they take a big focus on the kids' interactions in adolescence as well because the real thing that's happening here is these kids are teenagers and she's finding she has superpowers and she can't control them. And I think that that is a really rough time in your life anyway, right? Being a teenager is super rough. You're dealing with all of these hormones and your emotions are also subsequently all over the place. So it would be exceptionally difficult to be coming into having your superpowers manifest when they were unexpected and you no longer have your supportive parental figure that you are closest with and you are going through grief and also unable to control a lot of your emotions right now because they are affected by your hormones and all the confusion of everything being for the first time as a teenager. So overall, I really like the show. We're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk some more about the TV show I'm Not Okay With This. 
Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. going over a general introduction to the Netflix series, I Am Not Okay With This, it being based on a comic book, and it's kind of the things it has in common with Stranger Things, The End of the Effing World, and also The Magicians. I really like the approach that this show takes, because we see with The Magicians and with Harry Potter and shows like that, that there are adults to help these kids out. The same thing goes with X-Men. They are able, even if they are completely alone initially, to obtain a support system. Harry has not only the guidance of Dumbledore and McGonagall, but later on Sirius Black and his friends, Hermione and Ron, and even Ron's family, the Weasleys. In this case, this girl, Sid, has a family, but they're not very close, and she is supposed to be responsible for her younger brother, even if his emotional intelligence is at somewhat of a higher level than hers is at this moment. Liam tends to be a pretty even-keeled kid, but he is younger than her, and she feels a sense of responsibility towards him, even when she is fighting with her mom about needing to take care of Liam. She doesn't resent Liam for that, but he's also not someone that she can necessarily look up to as an embodiment of emotional intelligence, because she's a teenager, and he's still a lot younger than her. So... We see Sid kind of struggling in this way, and she's also struggling because her father has died and he killed himself, so that's really complicated. She's clearly not really in therapy, but her guidance counselor at school is trying her best to help, and Sid has mixed feelings about it. She has that classic teenage angst and uh, annoyance at adults where she's just like, I mean, okay, I guess... But the fact that she's willing to do it and some of her overarching narration tells us that she doesn't really hate the guidance counselor. She kind of appreciates someone being interested in talking to her about this since her mother is not able to right now because everyone in that house is experiencing grief in their own way. Their mom tends to be experiencing hers by throwing herself into work. I think part of how much the mom works is a grief response as well as it being necessary now that she is the sole provider and trying to help these kids stay afloat while she is making money as a waitress. I really like that they've paid attention to the socioeconomic status of the family in this series. A lot of these Netflix shows in particular seem to take a big assumption on middle-class families being the norm. And right now, in our socioeconomic terms, it's not really true in the United States. We may very well be headed for a recession, especially as coronavirus is forcing a lot of folks to stay home from work, even folks who are not eligible to work at home. Several of my friends have been told by their bosses that they are cutting hours right now. A factor that is associated with that may be that their insurance may be cut. The U.S. Department of Labor Standards state that uh, you get to decide as a company individually whether you are 
going to count full-time and part-time as a matter of whatever amount of hours. So that's why some companies are full-time as 40 hours or higher or 36 hours or even 30 to make people eligible for benefits like insurance. But these companies get to set them themselves. The Department of Labor or the Labor Bureau just really holds them to those standards that they have set on their own. So if you drop below a certain amount of hours, sometimes the Department of Labor will go ahead and go, hey, I'm going to fine you as a company. So instead of the company taking on the fine, because the last job I worked at, that fine was like $2,000 per person or so um, per month that that was occurring, then they may opt as a company to just drop the insurance. I hope that it does not come to that. I'm not sure what measures the government may put in place for that. But as a former manager, that is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately and how this is going to disproportionately affect folks who are of lower socioeconomic status. A lot of the economic reports recently have also supported the idea that we may be heading into a recession. So that is also potentially going to further widen the gap between people who make a lot of money and people who make a little bit of money. It's very problematic, and I think that it's a good time for shows like I'm Not Okay With This to really be representing that. We see the bit of embarrassment that Sid has when she goes into the grocery store, which looks more like a convenience store in my experience, but she says that she thinks she's been overcharged because her mom only gave her 50 bucks and the groceries ring up to 60 something. And she kind of has a minor emotional meltdown in her embarrassment and shame as a result of not having enough money and being aware that her family doesn't have more money. And then she just leaves the store without the groceries at all. If you've grown up in lower socioeconomic status, that may be something that you are familiar with. Having that kind of meltdown and having to put things back and being embarrassed about people seeing that. People you know and people that you don't know. And also her reluctance to accept help from her friend Stan, who is there with her and offers to front her the cash for the rest of it. And it's only like 16 bucks, but she is far too embarrassed to take him up on that and just kind of has an emotional meltdown and goes outside. And when you're having to worry about money, things like that that may seem small to other people can be really big for you. Everything can seem magnified. So I really appreciate how they have put a lot of effort into that and also things like the mom being concerned that uh, her daughter is wearing the same sweater two days in a row even though she's wearing different clothes underneath it. She's concerned with people thinking that she's a bad mom and that's probably also telling us a lot about how she feels in general. She probably feels like she's not enough because she is struggling to make ends meet and waiting tables and her husband killed himself. And a lot of people internalize that grief when someone that is close to them kills themselves and they feel responsible for it in a way. So the mom is largely probably not talking to the daughter because she's feeling a lot of responsibility and shame as a result of her husband killing himself. And that is just leading to a wider margin between how the mom and the daughter really are able to interact with each other, particularly in talking to each other. Although it's also fairly typical for teenage girls and their moms to fight a lot as the girls in her adolescence, but this is particularly strained right now. Sid is also an introvert, so this is even more difficult for her in many ways because she's not great at self-expression. She's not comfortable with it. She's not comfortable with new experiences and new settings either. So she is having a lot of new things happen to her all at once while she is also trying to deal with the superpowers and her dad being dead and having to take care of her little brother and dealing with her feelings she's developing for her best friend, Dina, 
who is very extroverted and outgoing, and Dina is kind of popular and beautiful, and Sid does not feel like she is either of those things. Sid also says at one point that she doesn't think that Dina would have been friends with her either if they had not been new kids at this school at the same time. So she has a lot of insecurity regarding her friendship. She doesn't quite understand necessarily why Dina is friends with her to begin with, but she has a lot of admiration for Dina. And as time goes on in the show, we see that those feelings of admiration aren't just because Dina has all of these traits that Sid lacks and that she perhaps wishes that she had in herself, but also because everything just seems so effortless for Dina and Dina never makes Sid feel uncomfortable to be around. Sid is just able to mostly be herself, although Dina does encourage her to step out of her comfort zone quite a bit. In that regard, we see that Sid is becoming, to a certain point, to be attached to Dina in perhaps a romantic way. We're going to go on another break, and when we come back, we are going to talk about some of the queer and romantic aspects of I Am Not Okay With This. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. talking about Sid's interactions with her mom and her friend Stan, as well as her brother and her friend Dina, and how she's having a rough time in sorting through all the new things that are happening to her. And in general, Sid's reaction to everything around her can be summed up with the title of the series, which is, I am not okay with this. She's not okay with pretty much anything that's happening around her as she's discovering who she is. So Sid is very attached to her friend Dina. She's an introvert and therefore Dina is one of the few friends that Sid really has. Indeed, it seems that for a lot of the show, Dina is the only friend that Sid has until she makes friends with Stanley. So Stan is her neighbor who lives a few blocks over and he's kind of awkward and weird too, like Sid. He's also more of a loner, but he is a really nice guy, and he's comfortable with being weird and comfortable with being who he is, whereas Sid is not comfortable with those aspects of herself. So she starts hanging out with Stan a little bit, when he offers her a ride to school and stuff. And she's like, okay, I guess, why not? But you can tell she's uncomfortable. But he's a nice kid. And so as her friend Dina starts dating this really popular but jerky jock at their school, and Sid feels kind of left out and alienated and a little bit jealous of the time that Dina is spending with her new boyfriend, Sid starts hanging out more with Stan. And she finds out that even though she thought that he was pretty weird to begin with, and he actually is pretty weird, that he's weird in a fun way. And that even though they are both 
different in many ways. They have a lot of similarities, and they're comfortable talking about and accepting the things that are strange or embarrassing as teenagers and each other. So they go and hang out a lot, and they start listening to music together, and Stan starts introducing her to different kinds of music. We learn more about Stan's backstory as well, and how while he seems well-adjusted and happy on the outside, he has to deal with a really crappy, abusive father. He only has to see his dad about five days per month, but those days are terrible, and Stan would much rather not see his dad at all, whereas Sid would give anything to have hers back. I really enjoy that conversation that they have, even though it's not so much a conversation as it is a very limited, awkward exchange in which Stan feels kind of bad about saying that he wishes he never had to see his dad, knowing that Sid misses hers, but she's like, no, it's it's fine, even though she's also thinking about that at the time. I know a lot of folks from growing up who have had similar conversations. And I liked seeing that on screen a lot. So it's not just about socioeconomic status, but also how these parenting styles can really impact the relationships between kids too. So these kids are already very emotional and it can really upset them when one expresses feelings that are different. But Sid and Stan handle that pretty well. They understand where the other one is coming from and are able to let it go without holding it against each other, even if they feel awkward in the moment. And Stan goes ahead and apologizes at the start, which I think is a very nice lesson for a lot of folks in regards to handling those awkward situations. It doesn't have to turn into a thing. Sometimes it's just awkward, and that's okay. I also really enjoy that that type of interaction is verbalized. It's very real and something I've seen in my experience over the years with folks who have lost a parent who was great to them or one who was terrible to them and other folks who were stuck with parents who were terrible to them. And those conversations can be very raw and emotional, or people can just kind of shut down and be awkward and not know where to go with it. And it rang very true for me in my experience of those conversations over the years. So hats off to the actors and everyone involved in the production of that show for getting a lot of these difficult concepts across very well. The narrative is sometimes a little bit lacking in the show, but overall, the emotional aspects and the parts that are unsaid make up for a lot of that, in my opinion. You're really getting a lot of the story with the interaction between the characters, even when it's just Sid and her mom mostly being silent on the couch. You can also see a lot of it in Sid's mom kind of laying her shadow on her daughter and vice versa. So at one point, Sid says that she is just wanting to essentially have a connection with people and the people that she loves act like they care for her back. And her mom says, maybe you're just expecting too much from other people. And that is something that Sid takes very personally and it really upsets her and that's valid but I think it also says a lot about where Sid's mom is right now and how she feels about the people around her. It's not ideal as a parental figure that she is voicing those things in this manner to her daughter but it is very indicative of how different people process grief differently. Sid and her mom are processing it both through anger and largely avoidance. Neither of them have really tried up until the scene with the sofa to sit there and have a conversation with each other. But when Sid tries, her mom is still not ready. She's exhausted from working a double shift at the diner and is having trouble in general with 
interacting with other people aside from Liam. She is saving all of her niceness for the people outside of the home for the most part, except for Liam, who tries very hard to dispel any sources of tension in the house, which is very much something that you see in families who have a lot of problems like this, who have a lot of tension. You often get one child who is explosive and another who is very much trying to keep the peace and be a people pleaser. So I'm very interested in a lot of the grief aspects of this because folks do handle it differently and also depression and anxiety. I think that there's a lot of that going on with Sid and her mother and we see that her mom is able to be nice to Liam because Liam is always diffusing everything and she still views him very much as a child whereas Sid is an adolescent. Sid's mom is also very nice to Dina. Dina's not her kid, and she is limited in her contact with Dina. Whenever she sees Dina, Dina tends to be very nice to her, as one often is more nice to your friend's moms than to your own parents. And in general, her mom is just kind of taking it out on Sid quite a bit, and vice versa. Their relationship is very adversarial at this point, and a lot of times it's just easier to lay your shadow on people and to take things out on the people who are closer to you, especially if you have anxiety or depression. And that does not make it right, but I do like seeing the reality of it portrayed on screen. A lot of times the niceness that you are able to display when you have the so-called spoons for it are used with other people. And that would be very important for Sid's mom's job because as a waitress, you know, they get paid like two fifty an hour plus tips. And this is something that is her entire being is having to go into this. She's having to use all of her spoons on being nice to these customers so that she can receive these tips to also care for her kids. So she's under a lot of pressure and she's also having to use all of her spoons for everything else. And she's having to ask a lot of Sid right now. And she's conscious of that, but also she feels like she has no other recourse. So when Sid is bucking up against her, the mom is just having a lot of difficulty in stifling her emotions because she doesn't have the spoons to really withhold a lot of that judgment and anger and still do the rest of her job and be kind to Liam and everything as well. So I really enjoy the grief aspect in this show and where they are taking this as Sid is no longer having the support of her mom. She's not able to turn to her little brother. She feels she can't turn to Dina right now either. And she starts turning towards her friend Stan. We're going to go on another break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Sid's relationship with Stan. Watching TV has changed over time. Streaming has become the new norm. That's why Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast dives headfirst to the world of cord cutting. Want to be on the loop of what's hot in Netflix? Or if it's not a preference, what about original shows in Hulu? We've got you covered. Join us as we fill in the blanks and talk about movies to stream and what show you should be binging. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Television Podcast. talk a little bit about where Sid does turn when she feels that she can't turn towards her previous support system, her father, her mother, her best friend Dina. 
as Sid turns more towards Stan, she also is at this point where her friend Dina has had sex for the first time, and this is a big deal in their lives and where they're at as teenagers. And Sid feels, you know, kind of adrift at this point in so many ways. So Sid hangs out with Stan, and Stan's kind to her, even when she is snappish and everything. He's able to go with the flow and just accept her as she is, which is something she really needs right now. So she starts comparing zits with Stan because she's really disgusted by the zits that she has on her thighs. And she's like, it's such a weird place to have them. And Stan is one of those people who wants to have these really deep conversations with you. He's not interested in small talk. So he asks her outright, hey, what's your deepest, darkest secret? And she briefly considers telling him about her powers at that point, but instead goes ahead and says, oh, I have these really gross thigh zits and is expecting him to still be pretty disgusted. But he's like, no, don't even come at me with that right now. He's like, check this out. And he pulls off his shirt and reveals that he has a ton of back knee. And they're both able to be like, oh, that's so gross. That's so weird. Like, why is that there? But also draw comfort from each other from the weirdness that they're experiencing, which is very human and also something that I really appreciate in a lot of friends. When you find that you have something in common with someone, it can be really magical. But there's a big difference between finding something that's somewhat normal, like having the same favorite book and having something in common like acne in weird places. Like it's a a different type of bonding when it's something that is maybe taboo in some sort of way or it is socially isolating otherwise. So I like that they're able to just really fully be themselves with each other in a way that Sid is maybe not even able to be with Dina. She cares a lot about Dina, but she also feels like because Dina is so pretty and so popular and outgoing that it's very difficult to share some of what Sid considers to be the uglier parts of herself, some of the troubles that she's having. And in this way, she can share them with Stan. So Sid and Stan end up forming a very close bond and they have sex, but Sid realizes in the sexual encounter that this is not something that she really super enjoys. And she kind of figures out through having sex with Stan, which is the first person she's ever had sex with, that she is actually into Dina and that she has a crush on her best friend. And it's not just jealousy that her friend is now spending time with this other guy, but rather that she has feelings for her as well. So this causes a little bit of trouble with Sid's relationship with Stan, but in true good guy fashion, Stan does not just get mad at her and act like he's been friend zoned. Stan instead understands where she's coming from. And although he's hurt and he does process his hurt, he also it still accepts Sid for who she is, and he still wants to be there for her, even as he is processing his emotions and going, okay, I can't be with her that way, but we are still really good friends, and we have a lot in common on a basic personality trait level as well, and this person is still important to me. Friendship for Stan is not a consolation prize, and that is partly why he's one of my favorite characters in the series. Stan is very in touch with his feminine side as well as his masculine side. He is the only person to stand up for Sid at one point in the show, and it really shows who he is at his core. He is a good person. He's just out here trying to do his best. And that 
makes me think of Santa Clarita Diet again, where Gary says, people can be more than one thing, Joel. Because at the same time, we see that Stan also deals drugs to make money. And we often think of people in TV shows and in life as being, you know, the bad guys and like the cool kids and everything who are more likely to deal drugs or extroverts where they just like don't care about the consequences. They're more likely to take risks. But instead, in this case, we have an introvert and he's kind of goofy, but also really laid back and a really understanding guy who has a poor home life with his father. Stan is largely neglected, and when his father's there, he's verbally abused. So Stan, I think, is a really great symbol of a lot of the resilience that can come from introversion and from necessary personal growth that is born from these poor interactions with parental figures. There's more than one way that people who go through these types of issues can develop. And although Stan's situation is not the exact same as Sid's, they're both being raised by single parents who are largely absent. And when they are present, they have an antagonistic relationship. So I like that they have these different approaches, but it's also somewhat bonding for these kids. Stan may very well be more accepting of Sid and her lashing out because he has a deeper understanding of where that is coming from. Stan seems to understand that she's going through a lot and that when people go through a lot like that, And when people lash out, it tends to come from a place of hurt rather than it actually being about that individual person. That is one of Stan's greatest strengths is he tends to not take any of Sid's anger personally. He just knows that she is going through something and that she's going to be snappish sometimes. And he accepts that. I think that is a lesson that It's taken me a long time to understand myself, but I do know people from when I was younger and I was a teenager who would understand that a lot better even way back then, and they would put up with me when I was snappish. So I think it's very believable that someone at 16 who's going through this situation can understand that just as well as someone who is like me, and it took them till they were about 31 to figure that out as well that you don't have to take all of these things personally when people lay their shadow on you, no matter what form that comes in, because that's just the way that some people express their pain. That doesn't mean that that's a healthy way to express pain, but by making space for them to express it and to know that they will be loved anyway, despite their emotional outburst, it can also lead to a lot of catharsis for other people. And in this way, we do get to see Sid expressing more of her emotions that she can't tell Dina. She has secrets with Stan that she can't tell even her best friend who she's been friends with for years. Just because Stan takes a different approach to these situations than Dina does. And I think that that's really beautiful. I also love these really wholesome male-female type of relationships where Things don't necessarily work out, kind of like Wynn and uh, Kara in Supergirl. I like how he started out kind of toxic and then was able to move into a much more friendly perspective later on. And I like that in this case, even though things didn't go the way that Stan had hoped, that he's still able to be super positive and wholesome in a way. And I think that he's a really great wholesome male character and he reminds me a lot of Eric Bemis in that way from Santa Clarita Diet except Stan is a lot more confident in who he is than Eric is even though they're about the same age. Stan's just comfortable in his weirdness and he doesn't care what other people think. He's going to wear his powder blue suit to school and dress like he's in an 80s music video even if Everyone, including his dad, tends to make fun of him for it. 
we're going to go on another quick break. Stay tuned. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about Sid's relationship with Stan and how he really helps her blossom as a person by letting her be who she is, even when it's ugly, even when she's not the way that he would have her be. She gets to just be. So I really love their relationship the most. I know Dina is supposed to be Sid's best friend, and I like their relationship too, but Stan is probably my favorite character in the series. I love Liam a lot too, and I always love a really good grumpy antagonist or an anti-hero like Sid, but Stan is really my absolute favorite. Very similar to how Eric is one of my favorites in Santa Clarita Diet. They're just wholesome, and they are just two dudes out there trying to do their best and be supportive to the people around them while also figuring out who they are and their own boundaries. I hope that in season two, if we get a season two, that we get to know Stan even better. I'd like to know more about his home life. I'd also like to learn more about Dina. We don't really know that much about her because as we start the story, we're told that she's Sid's best friend, but Dina is at that really difficult point in high school, really, where you're an adolescence and you're trying to figure out who you are as a person and sort out your priorities. I think a lot of us probably have friends or were the friend in high school who got a significant other and then poured all of their time and effort and energy into that person and alienated their friends. We had those folks in my friend groups and it was painful for a lot of the friends and it was painful on both sides, I think, because folks didn't understand this drive to spend all the time with that significant other and folks didn't understand why somebody would want to do that. So there's hurt feelings on both sides where it's like, Hey, you don't want to spend time with me anymore. I've been here for you this whole time. And now you don't want to spend time with me because you like this new person and sorting through the different types of love at that point, that family type love and friend type love versus a romantic type of love and how those affect the brain differently. No one teaches you that in school, not unless you are studying things like psychology or philosophy, and you tend to not learn those things until college. So when they're happening in high school, it is super difficult, and it is very hard for these kids to really process what's going on. If their parents didn't take psychology or philosophy classes that cover that, they don't even have a frame of reference for it either. And a lot of times, they're not going to go to their parents to talk about it anyway. So I like seeing that played out on the screen so kids can see that they're not alone and can see both sides of the coin, like how much Dina really cares about this guy and how much is going into her relationship with him and how she feels bad about not being able to spend as much time with Sid, but she feels conflicted. Should I go and take care of my boyfriend and take on more of this adult, almost girlfriend or wife-like role, really? Or should I go ahead and just go spend time with my friend? And it's really difficult for Dina, just as it's difficult for Sid to feel her friend distancing herself at that point. So it gets more complex as Sid determines that 
she has feelings for Dina, and she actually kisses her at one point. But Sid, ultimately, even though she's avoiding most of the conversation, she is upfront with Stan about what happened. She's honest with him. And even though it's a hard conversation for both of them, Stan ends up accepting her anyway. And then later on, we see that Dina is willing to talk about it too. And Sid isn't ready to talk about it with Dina yet, but she's trying. And Dina is trying to still be a good friend and goes and throws a tampon under the bathroom stall door for her and is like, okay, I hope you feel better. And it's such a female response that I absolutely love it. We've all been there where our friends are doing something weird or acting strange, and you're like, okay, I don't know what's going on with you, but here's an attempt to kind of help. I'm here when you're ready to talk. And, you know, you just throw whatever you can at the problem at the time. Sometimes that might be cake. Sometimes that might just be space. Sometimes it's a tampon. And in this case, Dina is kind of trying to do her best to approach the issue and to make the time to deal with this with Sid because Dina's recognizing maybe she wasn't spending as much time with her friend as she should have before. And it turns out that the boyfriend is not all he was necessarily cracked up to be. As the time also goes on in this, we see an interaction where Dina's boyfriend has cheated on her at that same party with some other girl who is supposed to be like the problem child of the school. We don't get to know this person very well. They don't do um, a really great narrative job of introducing her as more than a stereotypical bad girl. And I actually don't even remember her name. I want to say it's Jen or something like that. But uh, she's barely on screen. She's more of a plot device than a character at that point. And she has slept with Dina's boyfriend. And uh, it mostly is just there to establish him as being kind of a dirtbag. Because he cheated on her more than that one time. So when Sid finds out about this and then Dina walks into the room... We see Sid goes ahead and tells Dina what happened. And that makes the boyfriend really angry at that point. Now, they tried a bit to set up the narrative to really prepare us for the crazy change that happens in his attitude after that. But he's kind of, the boyfriend is kind of underdeveloped as a character. And so we don't really get a full sense of where this is going and his reaction. We know that he's kind of crappy and he picks on people before he starts dating Dina. And then he's still crappy to people, but he is making somewhat of an effort with Sid because he understands that it's important for him to be friends with his girlfriend's best friend. But Sid does not give him an inch, really. She just doesn't like him the whole time. And we find out later, as she does, she doesn't even understand at the beginning why she dislikes him so much, beyond the fact that he's been a tool to people around her and to her herself at different points, until she figures out that she has feelings for Dina. So, up to that point, he kind of tries, and he kind of tries again when they're in detention, when... uh Dina is forgiving him for breaking up with her essentially at that party, but before she finds out that he has cheated on her. And he kind of tries with Sid. I'll give him credit for that. He doesn't try super well. He's not trying to change essentially who he is as a person. He's only doing it to protect his relationship with Dina. And ultimately, he's still revealed to be kind of a dirtbag. But... He does try. Sid does not give him an inch at all because of her feelings for Dina. And then once Sid has divulged to Dina what she's learned about the boyfriend cheating on her, the guy completely loses his cool. And he kind of intimates that he's going to get her back for it. But then it just goes way sideways later on. The reaction seems a little bit disproportional because we don't know as much about the guy. 
So I think it would really have benefited from being a bit of a longer season so we could know more about these characters because we end up being told more than shown a lot when it comes to these characters like the bad girl and the jock boyfriend and stuff. Even Dina herself, we don't know much about. We mostly know a lot about Sid and Liam and Stan for the most part. And that is something that I think it really would have benefited from fleshing out the other characters a little bit because it doesn't have as much of an emotional impact in those ways. However, I still enjoyed it. And we get to the final scene um, and figure out why Sid is covered in blood. And that is really the penultimate moment for the show. So we're going to go on another quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about those last few episodes. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. about the development of some of the background characters and how they relate to Sid in different ways and further our story along. So by the time we get to the last few episodes, Stan already knows that Sid has powers and he's trying to help her figure them out and being the most Stan that he can be. And he's trying to be super supportive. And he reminds me again of Eric Bemis in this way, where Eric just happens to be a super geek and knows a lot about zombies and the occult. And in this case, Stan knows a lot about superheroes because he loves comic books. So he tries doing everything he can to trigger Sid's powers so that they can see them and learn more about the trigger so that she can wield them for good. That is Stan's goal for Sid. Sid does not necessarily want to use them for good. She's more afraid of them than anything else. So she's kind of like Kitty Pride or Rogue in that way, if we are thinking of this in like X-Men terms. But she's trying to figure herself out. There's also a little bit of Jean Grey in her. She uh, is not able to handle the magnitude of her powers, which seem to be growing, and she does not know what's going to happen next or how they're going to manifest. So up to this point, she's accidentally made a crack in the wall that she's just covered up by pressing her dresser against it. She's blown that stop sign or that railroad sign rather uh, totally off of where it's planted in the ground and it goes flying through the air after she throws a rock at it in anger. She's also made a kid's nosebleed. She accidentally killed her brother's hedgehog and has also really made a lot of things levitate. She's thrown some bowling balls through the wall. So we've seen an example of her strength at that point. And she's blown a lot of trees down just by being really upset and screaming because she's mad at herself for having kissed Dina at this party. So Sid is... Not handling this well, but Stan is doing his best to help her, and he's being a really good friend and keeping her secret. He's doing a lot better at dealing with a lot of this emotion and helping her out than we see with the kids in Lock and Key, where the older brother is just throwing himself into more extroverted activities in a way and is trying to be um, more sexual and that's where he throws his energies. The little brother is just very focused on the keys and the sister has removed her fear so that she does not have to deal with it anymore and it makes her super reckless. 
So we see some of the similarities between Kenzie in Lock and Key and her anger with her father's death as we do here with Sid. But in this case, Sid and her friend, her friend who is helping her with this, is doing better with keeping the secrets and everything. It's just between the two of them at this point. Until the jock steals Sid's diary that the guidance counselor told her to start keeping track of her emotions and stuff in at the very beginning of the series. So the jock finds her diary, and Sid doesn't know who has it at this point. She's just really upset and doesn't know where it is and is freaking out a little because she's talked about her powers in there and her feelings for Dina and everything. She also thinks that she's being followed. There was a large moment in the library where she blew the books down and all the shelves down and also thought that someone was following her at that point and she felt scared. So we find that by the time we get to the point where they're going to the school dance, that she's kind of freaked out and we're definitely heading in a very big supernatural direction. She thinks that there might be someone after her, and she wonders if her father also had an interaction with this person because her mom finds her in the basement where her father killed himself, and they finally kind of have a conversation about what happened. And the mom also reveals that part of the reason she's been keeping this to herself and not been talking to the kids about it is because The dad went through a lot of stuff that he did a good job in keeping from the kids so that the telling of what had actually happened is something that may change how the kids view their father. And the mom thinks Liam is still too young for this. But at this point, Sid has found a lot of his belongings that have been hidden in a box downstairs. And the mom decides she's going to go ahead and tell her. And that conversation has a lot of healing, I think, for Sid and for her mom. But it also leads to Sid kind of wondering if her dad had perhaps some of these powers as well. As it's revealed that he was involved in an explosion while he was in a war. And that everyone around him, all of his buddies, everyone on his side and everyone on the other side died and then he was discharged later. And that any time the mom tried to talk to him about these things and he would get emotional, he would leave the room. And Sid fills in the blank of where the mom is and she goes like, he was about to throw up. And the mom was like, yeah. Because that's how Sid feels too. She feels super freaked out and like she can't handle her emotions when she goes to talk to anyone but stand about this and in that way she's not able to harness her emotions and still talk about it which is further isolating but now she feels like in addition to stan maybe her father really understood it too and she wonders if perhaps his suicide had something to do with the person she thinks is following her So we don't see really this person that we think is following her. We're not sure if it's just in her mind at this point up until the dance. So since the jock and Dina are broken up, Dina and Sid decide to go together. And it's really cute. I like how this time when Sid goes out with Dina, Sid dresses herself and she does pick a dress, but she also wears her father's dog tags that she's recently found in the basement. And she's still kind of wearing boots. So she is embracing her femininity a little bit more, like Dina has been trying to convince her to do um, earlier in the show, but she is doing it her own way. And Dina shows up super girly and everything, but she's like, wow, you look really great. And she's being really supportive. She's not this time trying to make Sid wear makeup or do her hair or anything like she did in the episode with the party. So we see that Dina is perhaps growing a bit too and accepting Sid where she is. Perhaps. Or maybe this is just one episode and something different will happen if we get a season two. However, they go to the dance together and they end up dancing together too. And while they're dancing together, 
she goes ahead, Dina, and takes the opportunity to broach the subject of the kiss again because Sid has not really given her an opportunity to talk about it yet. And she's like, hey, I um, I actually, I did not like it. Um, so maybe we could talk about that. And Sid, you know, looks really kind of cautiously happy about it and a little confused and kind of mystified that this beautiful person who is her best friend and she super admires would maybe feel the same way back and actually isn't mad at her at all about it, but in fact might like her too. And this magical, very cute moment that a lot of us who have ever fallen in love or have had a crush and felt that crush begin to be reciprocated may find to be very relatable and adorable. But it's at this point where the jock freaks out and goes ahead and takes the mic as the teacher is introducing the prom king and queen. And it's revealed that the jock has Sid's diary, not the guy that she thinks is following her. And he starts reading it aloud to everyone and telling people about excerpts from it and about how she's in love with her best friend and everything and how the diary reveals that Sid had kissed Dina at that party as well and everything just starts kind of unraveling. Stan tries to stop him. Stan is the only person who is not just standing there in shock or in fascination and tries to stop the guy but you know he gets knocked out. He has his heart in a good place, but he's just not prepared uh, physically to come up against this guy. And this guy is just in a rage about it. And Sid is just standing there going in her mind, wishing that he would shut up. And that's all she wants. She's like, I wish he'd shut up. I wish he'd shut up. I wish he'd shut up. And he gets to the point where he is about to ridicule her for thinking that she has superpowers when her wish comes true. And... His head explodes everywhere. It is so gory at that point. Like, the hedgehog didn't explode. The most that we've seen in regards to blood at this point was the guy's nose bleeding earlier. We know that she's capable of big feats of strength, like telekinetic strength, but the guy's head literally explodes and just gets all over her. Just blood goes everywhere. A lot of people around her are covered in blood, and that's when we know what was going on at the beginning of the scene in the very first episode and what we've seen as harkened back to throughout the series up to this point where she's running down the street covered in blood. So Dina just looks horrified because she does not actually know about the superpowers either. She has not been told about that by Sid or by Stan. Stan is the only person who knows about it. But Stan is also knocked out cold on the ground, so Sid has no one to turn to. She's freaking out. She doesn't know if anyone even realizes that she's the one who did it. And she just bolts. She does not even take her diary off the ground. I suspect that Dina may grab that, to be honest, if we have a season two. But she just bolts and runs and seems to climb to the top of like some kind of watchtower or like a fireman's tower, like a forest fire ranger tower, and is standing there freaking out uh, internally. And then someone appears behind her in this black whoosh, I guess. It's not quite smoke. It's not quite sediment or debris, but they appear out of nothing. And we don't really see them. They're kind of like a hooded figure. Um, that is composed of smoke, black smoke almost, at a certain point. And we don't get to see their face, but we do get to hear them speak to her. And all she really says is, should I be afraid? And he tells her, no, everyone else should be afraid, and essentially states that they're going to start her training. We don't know if this is a good guy or a bad guy. I like that we left that as it is with Sid's current state of mind and her grief with her father. It could go either way. Might we get an anti-hero? Might we get somewhat of a villain or someone nebulously in between? Who knows? I'm really excited to see where the show goes next. 
despite some of the limited narrative aspects. I really like the show. I like that she's super mad at the world. A lot of folks did not like that when they reviewed it on the internet, but I found that overall, it's a really good show about grief and anger and how magic can come from pain. And in that way, I think that it's going to resonate with especially a lot of young folks, but also the young people that are inside of the bodies of us older folks. It can really harken back to our adolescence and evoke some of those feelings as well. Let's face it, when we were young people, our internal narrations might not have been super eloquent either. Sure, she throws the F-bomb out a lot and is mostly internally whining and complaining about what's going on around her. But when you're a teenager, you do tend to be kind of self-absorbed. Everything is happening for you for the first time, and you are dealing with that the best way you can. So in that regard, I feel like a lot of it's pretty true to life. And the supernatural elements in this tend to be kind of secondary. But it's also a great look at how this could play out for someone who did not perhaps get a great role model prior to everything going super sideways. There is no Robichaud Academy for gifted young women. There is no magical world of Hogwarts um, that it's safe for these kids to cultivate these powers at this point. There's also not a super great school for gifted youngsters with a really nice guy to help you learn everything along the way and a set of gifted teachers as well like you have in X-Men or even the Magicians. So I really like this loner solo kind of pattern, and I'm excited to see whether this new person who has been following Sid is going to try to lead her down a path of good or evil or something in between. And I'm excited to see how she reacts to that and how they develop the rest of the characters if we get a season two. Fingers crossed. If you're interested in learning more about the series in the meantime, I encourage you to check out the comics. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Sci-Fi Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show, and writing a nice review always really helps us. Also, if you could please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I'd appreciate it. Thank you kindly, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network, from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program